Welcome to Crime Weekly. On this first episode, I am going to be looking at several cases that have had some recent developments and or discoveries made. They are all unfortunately unresolved to this day. There is quite a few of them that could be resolved fairly soon. So let's get started. First up is the tragic story of Gannon Stouch. Gannon was an 11 year old boy who lived in Colorado with his father Albert and his stepmother Leticia. Uh, Albert, the father, he was out of town when all of this happened. So he was out of town. He was with the Army National Guard doing some training. So it was just Gannon, the little sister, and Letitia's daughter. She was 17 at the time. On January 27, 2020, Gannon is reported missing by his stepmother, Letitia. She had told El Paso County Sheriff's Office he had left home between 3 p.m. and 4 p.m. local time. She said that he went to play with an unknown neighbor who was Gannon's friend which struck me as odd because Gannon was supposed to be out of school sick and Letitia had to even call into her work because she was staying home with Gannon that day because he was sick. So on January 27th, he is labeled as a juvenile runaway. He was 11. On January 30th, Gannon's disappearance is upgraded. On January 30th, Gannon's disappearance is now classified as a missing endangered persons case. The sheriff's office asks anyone with information to call the authorities, and they blasted what was described as quote-unquote misinformation on social media about the case. Officials did not specify exactly what the so-called misinformation they were referring to. February 3rd, Letitia accuses social media users of vilifying her. She even claimed her family had received over 20 death threats. Though officials don't specifically address any rumors Letitia responded to online comments vilifying her in an interview with the local CBS affiliate, KKTV. Letitia told KKTV, quote, I took care of Gannon for the last two years in our home. I would never, never, ever hurt this child. And I know there are some questions out there. That's up to the investigators. When they end up letting you guys know, but I've cooperated with them, unquote. She went on to say, quote, we are going to find Gannon, and that's the main goal that we all have. I'm just ready for Gannon to come home, unquote. That's also when she said that she had over 20 death threats. The officials had used drones, search dogs, as well as volunteers in the search efforts logging over a thousand man hours. Searchers included the FBI Child Abduction Rapid Deployment, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and the Colorado Springs Police Department. On February 4th, a neighbor with surveillance footage comes forward. He claims Letitia left home with Gannon but returned alone. The footage shows Gannon leaving in a red truck driven by Letitia. 
at 10.13 on January 27th. Letitia returns at 2.19 p.m. Gannon is nowhere to be seen on the recording. On February 5th, the parents of Gannon, Albert and Landon, they make a public plea for Gannon's safe return. On March 2nd, Letitia is arrested and held without bail in Horry County, South Carolina. She is then extradited to Colorado. Her charges included first-degree murder of a child under 12 by a person in position of trust, tampering with evidence, child abuse resulting in death, tampering with a dead body, according to the El Paso Sheriff office. March 11th was Letitia's first court appearance in Colorado. She didn't speak and the sheriff's office had said they had filed over 100 search warrants and were confident Letitia was the suspect. On March 20th, Gannon's little body was found in Florida near a bridge in Pace, Florida. Near the Escambia River Bridge. Other than her first court appearance and her extradition, bail was denied. That was, of course, a no-brainer since she's proven that she is a flight risk. She drove from Colorado to South Carolina to get away from the investigation. They're believing that she ran from Colorado to South Carolina, allegedly stopping in Florida to dispose of a child. Well, to dispose of Gannon. Now this, this is my opinion. The thing I find especially gross was how Letitia wanted or needed praise or to be verbally called a good person. Normally you don't have to be called a good person person. You are known to be a good person because you do good things. That all she gave up by being a stepmom to Gannon and needing recognition for her being there for Gannon when she was always there and how, Gan or how Gannon's mother Landon was not. She expected a Valentine's Day card from not her husband, but from Landon for being in Gannon's life. Now, I hate to burst the bubble of Letitia, but when you marry a man that you know has children, you don't just marry the person you marry the, into the whole family. You instantly become a mother. If you don't want to have any more children, don't date a married man that has children and marry him. It's, it's a package deal. With the parent comes the child. With your husband that has a child, the child comes with him or at least that's how it's supposed to work in some cases it doesn't but everything Letitia had said on camera you know on the news was just petty she just came off as being petty and entitled Letitia is the one who had the affair with a married man with children she was even supposed to have been Landon's friend Gannon was never a surprise in any of this. I mean, it should be expected that most parents aren't going to get rid of the kid for their lover. I know it happens a lot. It happens a lot than it should. It shouldn't happen at all, but... I mean, time and time again it has happened that, that somebody will get rid of their children because the person they're interested in doesn't want the kid which that's totally messed up okay so everything court related in Letitia's case has been either put on hold 
or pushed back because of the COVID-19 virus. Now with all of these cases, I'm just going to give down, give a brief kind of rundown to get to the new stuff because these have been all over the news. These have just been widely on the news. I just want to make sure you know what's happened so far. I give my little opinion that don't mean nothing. Okay, next is the absolute bonkers case of Lori Vallow Daybell. Okay, this Lori's case is just bizarre. Okay, now this case, of course, is still unresolved. But as we get a few answers... You have to admit, all answers that are revealed get a hundred more strange questions and events surrounding all of this. But every, every bit of this is revolving around Lori. Okay, the saga truly begins when Alex Cox, Lori's brother, shoots and kills... Charles Vallow, Lori's ex-husband. Okay. The whole thing is made even stranger as Lori's ascent into the madness that is Chad Daybell. His teachings, his influence, everything about that guy, he just makes Lori seem even crazier. She wasn't always there to begin with. Now, Chad, in my opinion, is a hybrid doomsday prepper. You know, those people that like to dig out their backyard and put one of those bomb shelters in there, fill it with food that lasts in buckets for like five to ten years, and probably that would stock an arsenal of guns. I don't know if Chad went that far, but I don't know. So, Chad is a hybrid doomsday prepper. Revelations is nigh with a sprinkling of paranoia. And always saying the world is coming to an end. Which, if everybody that has ever prophesied the world is ending, the world should have stopped in like the 1200s okay Lori and Chad were telling anyone and everyone that would listen that people were turning into zombies so those people weren't people anymore they look like them but essentially the zombies body snatched these other folks everything I read it leads me to believe that Lori thought that Charles her ex one of her many exes, she married a lot of people, was a zombie. But in reality, he was just in the way. And she thought that there was a big insurance policy on him. So she talks her brother into murdering him. In my opinion, I think at the very least, Lori had influenced Alex into murdering Charles that she may or may not have put him up to it but at the very least convinced him that Charles was not a good person not to feel bad if you know something were to happen to him that he may have abused her or something like that that's all alleged I don't know I wasn't there because Alex is the one that shot Charles and there's a 911 tape out and it's been examined on on the internet a lot, so I'm not going there. So after Charles is more or less dispatched, you know, he's murdered, the family plus Alex leave Arizona to go to Rexburg, Idaho. I think they pick Rexburg because Chad Daybell is close by there. When Lori met Chad, there was an instant connection between these two. And neither one of these people were good for the other one. At all. Them meeting and getting together led to the deaths of... Or allegedly led to the deaths of a whole bunch of people. Lori had told 
her friend Melanie Gibbs that her daughter, 16-year-old Tylee Ryan, and her adopted son JJ were zombies. According to what Melanie had stated, everything that Lori had described to her that the kids were zombies is normal adolescent and teenage behavior. Kylie was getting fed up with Lori not being a mother to JJ anymore. She was constantly babysitting. She loved her brother, but she was 16. I know in the news it says that she was 17, but her last sighting, she was still 16. I mean, these were normal kids doing normal sibling behavior and just acting like normal kids their ages. Tylee just didn't want to spend all of her time babysitting. She wanted to live. So because she expressed her wanting to do other things, she conveniently became a zombie. Tylee was last seen on September 8th while at Yellowstone National Park with her family. That's the last time a picture has been circulated online with her in it. Chad's wife, Tammy, Tammy Daybell, she died on October 19th. They claim it was... If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's uh, creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you. So it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcast, and many, many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listen- listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast, and it's all in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started it's really easy and you're gonna have a blast making your own podcast on october 19th they claim it was a natural death that she passed away in her sleep But now, with all of these deaths that are following Lori and Chad wherever they go, they have exhumed her and are now waiting on, they are waiting on autopsy results. Just weeks after Tammy died, Chad and Lori get married. November 5th, 2019, in Hawaii. By the end of November, after many calls to Lori that were ignored, JJ's biological grandparents had become very concerned about him. And they were just wanting to know what was going on. So, um, after the runaround, they are eventually told that he is in Arizona and he's fine. Now, this case has gotten a lot of media attention because of how truly bizarre it is. Nobody has to sensationalize it because Chad and Lori have done that on their own. People around the world 
had become very invested in this, wanting to know where Tylee and JJ were. Because it's just strange that a mother would just more or less be ignoring people. You know, they're just wanting to know where the kids are. If they're safe, cool. But produce the evidence, especially when the police are telling you to, to produce the evidence of these children being alive. Because everything else points to they are not okay. She ignores, she as in Lori, ignore the police, or Lori had asked a family friend to tell everybody that they, that JJ is with her in Arizona. The friend, sensing something is up, and she's also wanting to know what in the heck is going on, she contacts the authorities. Finally, Lori has been arrested in Hawaii on February 20th, 2020 for abandoning her children. On March 4th, that is when her bond was reduced from $5 million to $1 million. It was $5 million in Hawaii. Now, Alex Cox had died due to a blood clot in his lung back in December. Alex had died December 12th of 2019. I guess karma has finally caught up with that guy because a lot more of his the things he has been up to are about to come to light. So they seize, the police seize Alex's cell phone. They use his GPS, the data that is on the phone, as well as where Wi-Fi was picked up to track his movements starting at the Yellowstone, the Yellowstone trip. So they see that Alex is at Yellowstone on September the 8th, that he leaves Yellowstone at 6.40 that evening. He goes to a local barbecue restaurant that's close to Yellowstone, then goes back to the apartment complex in Rexburg where he and Lori had their own apartments. Lori and the kids in one and Alex goes to the other. On September 2019, Alex, well his phone tells of some odd behavior because this is out of the norm for his normal movements, especially in the hours of midnight to 6 a.m. Normally, he don't go anywhere in the middle of the night. So, starting at 2.42 a.m. to 3.37 a.m., Alex is inside Lori's apartment. Then, later that same morning, at 9.21 a.m., Alex goes over to Chad Daybell's property. He stays to 11.39 a.m. And according to the GPS records, he is on site where JJ and Tylee's remains were found in June of 2020. Chad had, on September 9th, had done had texted his wife a strange message about a raccoon. Now, if you don't know, raccoons are very... They only come out at night. The only time they do not come out at night is if they're under stress, if the raccoon is pregnant or has just given birth and has to eat a little bit more. Normally, they don't go out during the day. They're nocturnal. Or they have rabies. That's normally the only time you'll see a raccoon being out during the morning like that. Late morning, 11.53. He told her in the text message that he had watched the raccoon and then shot it and buried it in their pet cemetery that happens to be in their backyard. I believe he did that to cover the bases with his wife of why there is recently disturbed ground 
in the pet cemetery. Because you just don't go digging up dirt in a cemetery, whether it's a pet cemetery or, you know, un- un- unless you have a reason to, and that is to be burying a pet and none of their pets had died. But that just happened to be the spot where police unearthed the bodies so many months later. Neighbors had also reported that Chad and Tammy hardly ever had bonfires, but that autumn, beginning in September, they began to be a regular affair. And all of the neighbors thought that was very odd. So the police are, they're, they're using all of this information from Alex's cell phone. Because, I mean, they've got to find these kids. So they go to the location on the GPS and that's where they find JJ's body wrapped in plastic and bound with duct tape. And they find Tylee's body. She's dismembered and some of her bones had been burnt. The police have theorized that while Chad is doing the out of character bonfires back in September, He was actually trying to get rid of Ty Lee's body. Completely. She was 16 years old. She was not long away from her 17th birthday. And one of those people killed her. They cut her up. Dismember her and try to burn her like she's nothing. I don't understand why they had to go to those lengths if the kids were in the way. For whatever reason, they thought they were in the way. Why didn't they just send them to live with other people? I just don't understand it. I don't think I'm meant to understand it because... I, I don't, I could never hurt my kids. I could never, ever, ever dream of hurting them. If I accidentally hurt their feelings or when I had to get onto them or punish them in any way because of, of whatever reason, it broke my heart to do that. But the increasing number of these reports of especially their mothers having something to do with the deaths of their children, it's just awful. That's one reason I've been having a hard time putting together the episode I've titled Brazil's Lost Child is because, again, the death of a child at the hands of his mother and what they did to that kid is just unspeakable. I was going to do four cases, but I'm just going to leave it at two for now. Gannon's and Tylee and JJ's. And I will be back next week with more crime news or crime weekly news. Whatever I'm eventually going to end up permanently calling this thing. It's a work in progress. So I hope you found my analysis, my amateur analysis interesting and join me next time on southern storyteller i've been holly have a good one y'all